Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 111. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. We turn to God in a moment of silent prayer. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah, who hath created the heavens and the earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ our Lord, through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We turn together to Psalter number 302. 302. As we do so, we have an announcement, and that is that we rejoice with Kyle and Emily Westra in the birth early this morning of a daughter, Sailor Joy. Emily and Sailor are doing well, for which we're thankful to God. We sing the three stanzas of Psalter number 302. direct our attention to God's commandments as set forth in Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, 
or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. We have a summary of these commandments given us in Matthew 22. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We respond turning to Psalter number 40, the divine law. The law that the Lord has ordained is perfect, the soul to restore. His truth makes the simple most wise, the truth that is sure evermore. Arise and sing the six stanzas of number 40.
return to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come into thy presence on this beautiful day that thou hast made, counting it a joy and a privilege that we are able to worship and to exalt and to magnify that name above every name. Lord, in this past week, as we have considered our circumstance and our situation in the midst of this life, we have been brought once again to the wondrous realization of our own unworthiness, of the wonder of Thy love and Thy grace, and our complete dependence upon Thee. Thou hast taught us who we are, that of ourselves we are nothing, but by a wonder of grace we have been adopted into the family of our Heavenly Father. The Creator of heaven and earth has embraced us in love, redeemed and delivered us from the bondage of sin, and given us to know fellowship and communion with Thee. A fellowship and a communion that's not just experienced this morning for a time, but which is ours everlastingly. And Lord, we gather to show forth our thankfulness. What a wonder to confess that our identity is caught up with the Creator of heaven and earth and with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that we believe that we are not our own, but we belong to Jesus Christ. And belonging to Jesus Christ, we come in Thy presence with joy, with thankfulness. We come as those who are not ashamed, but those who rejoice in the wonder of grace showered upon us so undeserving as we are. And Lord, as we experience Thy mercies and Thy compassions, the goodness, we are thankful. And we gather in that thankful spirit. Grant that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be assured that Thou art the one continually at work within our hearts and lives, exposing those hidden faults, bringing them to our attention that we might confess them and that we might turn from them, and that Thou wilt continue to uphold and to strengthen us and to grant us all that we need. Lord, we look to Thee as those who confess that we are poor in spirit. We have nothing of ourselves to bring. And as those who are poor, those who are dead in trespasses and sins, Thou hast quickened us. And Thou hast given unto us a life that is from above. And grant that we might live in the joy and hope of that glorious everlasting life. We thank Thee for the privilege of coming to Thy house in order to hear Thy word proclaimed. May Thy servant bring that word in faithfulness and in truth. May Thy word stir us to the depths of our beings. And may it be a means and power unto our salvation. Hardening, but also pricking, exposing, comforting, encouraging, that we might live in the comfort of that word and the hope that is found therein. And we're thankful that we can gather as a church of Jesus Christ, confessing that Thou art the one who has gathered us. Thou hast powerfully and irresistibly drawn us to Thyself. Thou hast established this church in this place. And it is with thankfulness that we come into thy presence, that we confess our union with thee and our love for one another. And may that love for one another also be evident as we pray one for another, as we uphold one another in the midst of our trials and concerns, and as we together look to thee to uphold and to sustain us. And we thank thee for the gift of another covenant child to the congregation. Be with Kyle and Emily as they embrace their first child, little sailor. May they know thy love. May they know thy care for them as parents as they now take up this awesome responsibility. Thou art the one who not only grants unto us this covenant gift, but the one who also promises to uphold and to sustain us as parents. And above all, may they cling to thy covenant faithfulness, clinging to thy word and the promises that thou hast given. I will be a God unto thee and to thy seed. Lord, we lay hold on that promise. We do so confessing that we are unworthy to receive these precious gifts from Thy hand. And yet Thou dost entrust them to us, weak and sinful as we are. But Thou art faithful. 
And now what grant unto us strength to be faithful to that promise and to be able to train them up in the fear and honor of thy name. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt mightily work by thy spirit in the hearts of our little ones, even from infancy on, that they might hear the voice of their heavenly Father and that they might know the comfort and the peace that is theirs in believing that they too are not their own, but belong to him as their Lord and as their Savior. We're thankful for the work of grace in the hearts and lives of our children. Continue to draw them to see their sinfulness and unworthiness. Turn them away from the foolishness of their own natures and grant that they might live in the joy that is theirs in Christ. And we're thankful for our schools, for the teachers thou hast given us. Thankful for the school board and their labors as they oversee the daily operations of the schools. Continue to uphold and to grant wisdom and understanding to all involved and grant that we might ever live in the conscious joy and hope of thy covenant faithfulness. Lord, preserve and be near unto us now. Grant that we might know and live in the conscious wonder of a Savior, a Savior who died on Calvary to cover our sins. And though we do battle against the powers of temptation and sin, though we fail every day, grant, Lord, that we might, through tears, confess those sins, that we might cling to the wonder of thy forgiving mercy and grace, and that we might ever go forward with joy and with thankfulness, trusting and believing that the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient. And that alone has covered all of my sins and given unto me the hope of life everlasting. Grant, Lord, that comfort, that hope, and that joy. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. An offering will be received for the general fund. We turn to Psalter number 244. 244, Lord, through all the generations of the children of our race, in our fears and tribulations, Thou hast been our dwelling place. We're going to sing the five stanzas of number 244.
turn to the book of Song of Solomon. As we continue to treat the book of Song of Solomon on the occasion of the Lord's Supper, we take up where we left off last time at chapter 4, verse 8. And so we'll read chapter 4, verses 8 through chapter 5, verse 1. And those verses will actually constitute also the text of the sermon this morning. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. We hear the word of God. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, campfire with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloe, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink. Yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. We read that far. May God bless his word to our hearts. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, we've noticed as we've proceeded through the Song of Solomon the challenging aspects of understanding and describing what's taking place. We noticed last time in the preceding verses the wedding procession as Solomon went to go get his bride. We're still in the section here where Solomon is thinking where the bride is thinking back on all the events of her wedding day. Chapter 3 involved the wedding procession. Chapter 4, the expressions of intimate love one to another. And now we have an intimate situation where the bride and groom are alone on their wedding night. We have a beautiful, poetic description of the sexual experience that is theirs. And we have a celebration of the God-ordained connection between marriage and the sexual relationship, the culminating of that marriage in the marriage bed. This text is at the exact center of the book, strikingly. It would seem that that was deliberate, building up to this climax and then continuing 111 lines prior to verse 16 of chapter 4, and then we have 111 lines after Verse 5, verse 1. But beloved, we see in this more than just that marriage relationship. And it's important that we understand as we have going through this book the significance of the Word of God for the church of Jesus Christ. The Word of Jehovah God as He in love speaks to us, His children. The book does not treat sexual desire like a biological appetite. It treats it tenderly, and it treats it in the context of marriage. The physical union is in the context of tenderness and of love. It's the way of purity and faithfulness, single-hearted devotion. The husband and wife are brought together as one flesh. God's the one who's ordained all of this, and God ordains this as that which is good and pleasing when in submission to His will. Outside of his will, there's shame, there's guilt. The way of playboy, of pornography, is a way of bondage, it's a way of shame. 
God calls us to sanctified use of the sexual relationship in the context of married love. And in this intimate union, there's a mystery. And that mystery is the focal point of our text and sermon this morning. The mystery of Christ and His church. God draws us to Himself so that we feed on Him and we enjoy the intimate wonder of the passion that we have for Him and for His glory and for the wonder of what He's done for us. Having examined ourselves, knowing our own sinfulness and our own unworthiness, we see the wondrous love with which He's embraced us. He's drawn us to Himself. And we live in the joy and the wonder of that delight. We look at this text noting the heights of love. Noting, first of all, His appeal. And then finally, her invite. His appeal is stated, Come with me from Lebanon, verse 8. My spouse, with me from Lebanon. The groom desires to take his bride to the mountain peaks of love. And the bride is presented here as being far away in some distant place. Now the picture isn't merely that of being far away physically, but the fact that her body had not been accessible. She was off limits prior to marriage. He's not luring her to come away with him so that they can go on a journey and involve themselves in premarital sexual relations. He's now calling her to the marriage bed. The marriage ceremony is over. And now it's just the two of them now. And the joy and intimacy of that marriage bond is now to be realized. And strikingly, the passage also does not present it merely in a physical way, not merely as a matter of sexual release. There's an intimacy, there's a love that characterizes that relationship. And that's shown especially in the language, my spouse, my sister. It's striking that this is the first time we find that language in the book of the Song of Solomon. My spouse. He uses now that language repeatedly. We find it in verse 9, again in verse 10, again in verse 12, and verse 1 of chapter 5. He's using new names now for his bride. He's calling her his sister, his spouse. Now what's the significance of that? The reference to spouse occurs now six times here in our text. Nowhere else in the book. So that he's emphatically emphasizing the fact that she now is married to him. He's connecting the sexual relationship very closely with marriage. There's a turning point here in that marriage now creates that legal bond in which it's appropriate for them to enjoy the intimacies of the garden, the intimacies of the fountain that previously were shut up, previously were locked. Now they're opened up. My spouse... But then secondly, my sister. We know that's not a literal reference. She's not literally his sister. But there's something beautiful about that. There's a bond that unites the two of them even more intimately than their marriage. And what is it? They're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's the wonder, the beauty again of our marriage in the Lord. That bond that unites them is not simply the fact that God has taken them and joined them together in that bond of marriage. But they're sons and daughters of Jehovah God. And they rejoice in the intimacy of that spiritual union that God has given. That spiritual union is primary. That spiritual union is their primary delight. As they live together and as they do so as sinners... What is their confession? We belong to Christ. And as those belonging to Christ, we've been adopted into His family. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And in the joy of that union, we're able to go forward and we're able to live as husband and wife in our marriage. Beloved, this is a powerful reminder once again that God never intended the sexual relationship to exist of itself. Even the legal union of marriage is not sufficient in itself. It's in the context of the wonder of Jehovah God 
adopting to himself two individuals, bringing them together then in marriage, that now, knowing the union that they exist with God, their union with one another, now that delight of their physical union is experienced in connection always with that spiritual oneness in Jesus Christ. When God ordained marriage, He did so in the context of that union of body and soul in Christ by which they would now enjoy their lives together. And from marriage on, we confess we're not two separate individuals. Two are made one. There's a marvelous wonder. There's a mystery there. Even as I'm not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. There's now an intimacy, a union that exists between man and woman in which mutual care, companionship, respect, love, self-giving flow out of. Ephesians 5, as we well know, speaks of that mystery. The mystery by which a man and a woman are joined and made one flesh. And the wonder of that being a picture of Christ taking hold of us as His children, His bride, making us bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh. Now we have a situation as we proceed through this text in verses 9 and following where the groom is taken by the bride. He's consumed, not just with the sparkle in her eye and the wonder of her love and her beauty, but he's taken by her. And that's reflected in the way in which he speaks now concerning her. We have verses 8 through 15. The words of the groom now to his bride. And as he leads his bride to the heights of love, he expresses the fact that she's already brought him there. He expresses appreciation for her, for everything that she's done for him. He talks about in verse 9, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart. What does he mean? What is he talking about there? The idea is that literally she's driven him out of his mind. He's lost his head as a result of the love that he has for her. Previously, she declared that she was sick with love in chapter 2, verse 5. And we have now that mutual idea being expressed now by the groom. Her eyes, the jewelry that's around her neck, captivate him. And what started with preoccupation with him on her behalf now goes full circle in that he expresses his intense desires for her. These aren't just kind compliments that are expressed. There's an intense expression of the desire that belongs to marriage and the fiery passion that God has worked within them, one for another. Verse 10 expresses how she's better than the greatest need or want that he might have. He compares her with all the excesses of life, all the delights of life. Fine wine, exotic spices. Solomon knew the best. He had everything that money could afford. And yet, he says, you mean more to me than everything else that I have. Now again, we see the significance of that. Not just as husband and wife, but our relationship with our God. And the wonder of His words to us, delighting in us, Rejoicing in us by grace. Verse 11 expresses the wonder of what it is that she involves. And we think there of the significance of the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan often was spoken of as a land of milk and honey. And here, he speaks of milk and honey. Often God promised that that land would flow. It would flow with milk and honey. And what was that a picture of? It was a picture of the generosity with which God would care for His church. And now this song says, 
My bride is like the promised land. It's that which is a symbol of prosperity, of fruitfulness, of rest. All of those which characterize the land of Canaan. Her words are sweet music to his ears and there's abundance of love that is expressed by her tongue. Beloved, this is how he leads her to the heights of love. We might think, what overkill? What does this do to her? What does this do to her heart? He emphasizes the fact that his life is all about her. His life is all surrounded with her. He's captivated with her. The high places of love are not about him. They're about her. And we see here the selfless spirit with which he conducts himself. She's beautiful. Now we've noted previously, where did her beauty come from? Her beauty came from the king. It came from him. So that her beauty is always connected with the king. And he praises now that beauty that he sees within her. There's no selfishness. There's no pride. Everything is about her and about her beauty and her glory. Beloved, this is the context in which God presents the sexual union between the man and the woman. We think of Adam and Eve. Adam knew his wife according to Genesis 4 verse 1. Peter puts it this way, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. We're called to respect. We're called to honor. We're called to love the wives that God gives. She is precious as a precious vessel. And we're to treat her with kindness. We're to express that love and that joy and that delight. This is the way that God leads us to the high places of love. And so that we have a beautiful expression here of the love of Christ for His church. We find the fulfillment in life, not in our earthly relationships, but always in that relationship with Christ. Now, it's important for us to take a few moments to think about that. We must not think this morning that if we're outside of the opportunity to enjoy sexual relationships, then we're missing out. We must not think if we don't have a spouse or if we're not able to enjoy that relationship in marriage as we would desire, there's something lacking. Nor may we think that our pursuit of the things of this life apart from Christ would be profitable or in any way result in any kind of blessing. The joy, the delight of the life that God gives us is wrapped up in Christ and in the wonder of the love of God for us. And it's because of that love that all of the other relationships in life are able to be enjoyed and that serve the glory of God. Christ is the one who looks upon us in love. And so we are being directed here to see the wonder of of Christ and His love for me and for you. Just as there's no joy in the sexual relationship outside of marriage, there's no joy, no delight in living outside of Christ. To live apart from God is death. Christ is the one in whom we delight. He is our all in all. He's the one who makes us beautiful. He's the one who embraces and draws us to Himself. He's the one who captivates us with His love and expresses His selfless love to us. He's the one who gives Himself on Calvary for us so that His love isn't a hidden mystery to us that we're not able to know. It's a wonder. It's that which supersedes all of our expectations, all of our imaginations. But that love is an everlasting love. And it's that we're able to understand and know. And that's what the Bible is all about. That's why Christ gives pastors and teachers so that they can tell the church about that love of Christ. This is the importance of the gospel as we gather together in worship that we might hear the wondrous love of God in Jesus Christ. And the apostle speaks of this in Ephesians 3 verses 14 and following. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, 
may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. God gives pastors, He gives preachers and missionaries in order that the people of God might be built up in the wonder of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And that we might know the depths of that love. That we might know the wonder of that love as a love that passes all knowledge. A love that moves us beyond anything that we can explain. Anything that we can understand. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And that rooted and grounded in that love, we might be filled with the fullness of God. Beloved, what a wonder. This is the message that the bride needs to hear. Christ loves you. Christ has embraced you. He's taken hold of you. He's drawn you to Himself. He delights in you. He paid the price of His own blood. He considered not His own life precious for the sake of the bride whom the Father had given Him. And so precious in His sight, you and I are, that He gave of Himself. And then He draws us most intimately and tenderly into His embrace. And He gives us to know the wonder that nothing can separate us from that love. And that He will preserve us and He will keep us and He will walk with us now and to all eternity. Beloved, this is the answer to the temptations that you and I face. We face fears. We face doubts. Why are we tempted to walk in sin? We're tempted to love the world. And the things that the world offers seem so appealing. Why is it that we're so fearful at times of the faces of men? Why is it that we're so fearful to stand for what's right? We don't have a large enough understanding of the wonder of this love. We fail to embrace the marvelous nature by which Jehovah God has loved us in Jesus Christ. And that love of Jesus Christ for us doesn't occupy a big enough place in our minds so often. That love of God in Jesus Christ drives away fears. It enables us to endure hardship. It enables us to stand in the midst of hatred and persecution. That love of God in Jesus Christ is as a fire burning within us, enabling us to endure everything for the sake of this One who loved me unto death. In our marriages, there are times when there's doubts and there's questions. And it's so important that we do not give any occasion for our spouse to doubt our love for them. There are times we fail, we Give excuses. We're not as faithful as we ought in assuring them and showing them that love. But beloved, we never need worry about whether or not our bridegroom ever treats us in that manner. He loves us. And He says, you need to know my love. You need to know the depths of that love. You need to know the wonder of that love so that all of those fears can be driven away. And so He takes us and He brings us to the high places of love. He causes us to sit together in heavenly places with Himself, Ephesians 2. Taking hold of us by His own right hand. Leading and guiding us in love. Assuring us nothing can separate you from Me. I will hold you. I will keep you. And though you fall, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to preserve you. And He keeps us separate from the world. Cut off from the doubts, the fears of the world. Exalted to highest heaven. And can we begin to explain the joy, the wonder, the intimacy of that union that is ours with Christ? Christ lifts us. He brings us into the fullness of glory. That's the wonder of His Word. That's the wonder of the preaching as a means of grace by which we might know that. And that's the wonder of the sacraments as means of grace. He gives us this morning a foretaste of that marriage supper which we anticipate and look forward to. 
when He will bring us into the intimacy and the wonder and the fullness of that without sin, without temptation. The sacrament lifts us to the high places of His tender love and His faithfulness in Jesus Christ. My spouse, my sister, that's the Word of Christ to you and to me. We belong to Him. We are His. In response, we have her invite. In verse 16, we have now the shift of language. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. We have the expression of the bride now responding to the advances and to the intimacy of her husband and drawing him to herself in intimate love. She uses again the analogy of a garden. We saw that first. Here in this text in verse 12, but going all the way back from the very beginning of the book, we saw that analogy with regard to the garden. She's a garden of beauty. She's a garden that's intended for pleasure. A living garden. A garden filled with all kinds of bountiful plants. A garden that's filled with life. We just think of the Garden of Eden. We can't even imagine the beauty and the wonder of that garden, but a beautiful garden that was filled with all sorts of beauty, that was filled with life. That's her body that she's speaking of there. Now, it was a garden enclosed. It was a garden that was locked up. It wasn't open. And it's still not open to the public. Only one has a key to this garden. And that's her beloved. This is a woman talking from the perspective of having kept her virginity for her husband. And on her wedding night, her husband now has that key. We have a young woman here giving herself now to her husband. The relationship in marriage, not cold, not mechanical. Responding to his kindness. Following and giving of herself to him. This is the only time in this passage that she speaks. And when she speaks, it's all about Him again. Demonstrating that selfless spirit. There's a selflessness here. As they're joined in one now, it's not about me. It's about you. And she calls Him then to come. Now, In our day and age, we're told that sexual purity doesn't really matter. Sexual relationships are not to be preserved in the Bond in the union of marriage. What a lie. The high places of love are to be enjoyed in the way of purity and faithfulness. We're called to keep ourselves for our wedding. And we're called to be faithful as husbands and wives within that holy bond. As young people, it's more important than ever before that you hear that word of God as to what God requires of you. The pleasures of the physical relationship come only in the context of marriage. And you need to keep that gate locked unto marriage. There's only one who's allowed to have that key, your future spouse. This part of your life is not for public consumption. Not even for the one that you might marry. It's reserved for your wedding night. And in marriage, we're called to keep ourselves pure. Be ravished with the one whom God has given us. Drink waters out of our own cistern, out of our own mountain, as the book of Proverbs repeatedly notes. Now, strikingly, the book of the Song of Solomon argues for purity in a different way than the rest of Scripture. Instead of focusing, as the book of Proverbs does, for instance, on flee fornication, emphasizing the need to avoid the sin and to flee from that sin, the book of Song of Solomon paints a beautiful picture of what a biblical marriage is intended to be. And having painted that beautiful picture then, grants by that an encouragement to us to hold in high regard this beautiful bond and to do so for the glory and for the honor of God. We know the antithesis applies in every area of our lives. We need to hear the positive as well as the negative. God in the beginning, placed 
two trees in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. God said eat with regard to the one. God said don't eat with regard to the other. Here in this passage, the emphasis is on eat. The emphasis is on the positive. Enjoy the blessings of that relationship that God has given within the realm of marriage. But even within the realm of marriage, don't just treat it as that which is a cold experience without intimacy and without the love. Solomon places emphasis here on the wonder of the intimacy that's ours together in Christ. This is about serving God. This is about glorifying and honoring His name in this holy bond of marriage. It's a matter of giving of myself for the sake of one another. It's a matter of pouring my body into the service of my God and my Lord. It's not just a matter of pursuing my own pleasure, pursuing the sexual relationship for my own benefit. So many are tempted along that way, as we all are, to pursue that sexual relation for me. To pour our bodies then into the pursuit of sin, ungodliness. We repent. How tragic to take something so precious, so beautiful, and to reduce it just to pleasure. How sad to take something so beautiful as our bodies, a garden that God has stocked with beautiful flowers, and to allow it to just simply be trampled flat and enjoyed outside of the realm of faithfulness to God. There's a spiritual idea here. The bride of Jesus Christ keeps herself unspotted from the world. The high places of communion with Christ are enjoyed in the context of purity. Knowing my sin and unworthiness, knowing God as my Savior, I delight in Him and I desire to magnify and exalt Him. I desire to serve Him in thankfulness. I come to the table desiring a closer walk with my Lord. I need Him. I love Him. And I desire to dwell with Him now and to all eternity. Our walk with Christ involves inclusive, exclusive love. A love that's for Him alone. I am come into my garden. We read in chapter 5, verse 1. Solomon here responds to the call of his bride. He enjoys the pleasures and the wonders. There's a beauty, there's a joy that is his that transcends explanation. But then notice the final phrase of that verse. The last phrase of verse 1 of chapter 5. Eat, O friends, drink. Yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. We have here another change of subject. And strikingly, we have here a response of God to the two lovers. So that we have a situation where the bridegroom has sought the bride. The bride has responded in seeking her bridegroom. The bridegroom has expressed the fact that they have enjoyed and entered into the blessedness of it. And Jehovah God now expresses His blessing. We think of the beginning when God created all things and God said, it is good. God now says, eat, O oh friends, drink. Yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. God calls them to faithfulness within this bond. And God reminds us of the wonder of His blessing on that relationship. Endorsed by God. Enjoy that marriage bed as that which is undefiled, and do so with a view to the glory, the honor of my name. Now, beloved, we gather together this morning as those who know guilt. We know shame. We've not protected that purity as we ought. We've not maintained that faithfulness to our God. God looks upon us in Jesus Christ. God looks upon us as His beloved. Jesus Christ comes to us and says, My sister, my spouse, you're forgiven. You're cleansed. I love you. I gave my own life to wash you and to cleanse you from all your iniquities. 
I gave my life for my bride so that she could be presented pure and chaste on that wedding day to my heavenly Father. And he married us, beloved, not because we were so beautiful, not because we were so wonderful, to make us beautiful by the power of his grace and his transforming love. And this God now calls you and calls me, drink, drink abundantly out of that relationship that I've established with you. I've drawn you to myself. You are mine. Live now out of that burning love for me, that delight in the things of God's kingdom, that joy and that wonder as you give yourselves as living sacrifices in thanksgiving to Him. Beloved, this is the truth that powerfully works in our hearts and that urges us to go and sin no more. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank Thee for the wondrous love with which Thou hast loved us, for drawing us to Thyself, giving unto us to know a foretaste of that bliss and that joy in the midst of all our fears and all our uncertainties, coming to us this morning and saying, Drink! Lord, may we partake of that sacrament by faith. And may we do so in love. And may we grow in our walk with Thee. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We turn to page 91 in the back of our Psalters to the form for the administration of the Lord's Supper. The consistory has granted approval to Emma DeBoer to join us this morning at the table as her membership is in the process of being received from First CRC in Sioux Center. And we've also granted approval to Mr. Nathan Mancusi, a member of our Cornerstone Protestant Reformed Church, who's recently moved to Hall to join us at the table this morning. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, attend to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Holy Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 29. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That we may now celebrate the supper of the Lord to our comfort, it is above all things necessary, first, rightly to examine ourselves, secondly, to direct it to that end for which Christ hath ordained and instituted the same, namely, to his remembrance. The true examination of ourselves consists of these three parts. First, that everyone consider by himself his sins and the curse due to him for them, to the end that he may abhor and humble himself before God, considering that the wrath of God against sin is so great that rather than it should go unpunished, he hath punished the same in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with the bitter and shameful death of the cross. Secondly, that everyone examine his own heart, whether he doth believe this faithful promise of God, that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the passion and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed and freely given him as his own, yea, so perfectly as if he had satisfied in his own person for all his sins and fulfilled all righteousness. Thirdly, that everyone examine his own conscience, whether he purposeth henceforth to show true thankfulness to God in his whole life, and to walk uprightly before him. As also whether he hath laid aside unfeignedly all enmity, hatred, and envy, and doth firmly resolve henceforward to walk in true love and peace with his neighbor. All those then who are thus disposed, God will certainly receive in mercy, 
and count them worthy partakers of the table of his son Jesus Christ. On the contrary, those who do not feel this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment to themselves. Therefore we also, according to the command of Christ and the Apostle Paul, admonish all those who are defiled with the following sins to keep themselves from the table of the Lord and declare to them that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ, such as all idolaters, all those who invoke deceased saints, angels, or other creatures, all those who worship images, all enchanters, diviners, charmers, and those who confide in such enchantments, all despisers of God and of his word and of the holy sacraments, all blasphemers, all those who are given to raise discord, sex, and mutiny in church or state, all perjured persons, all those who are disobedient to their parents and superiors, all murderers, contentious persons, and those who live in hatred and envy against their neighbors, all adulterers, whoremongers, drunkards, thieves, usurers, robbers, gamesters, covetous, and all who lead offensive lives. All these, while they continue in such sins, shall abstain from this meat, which Christ hath ordained only for the faithful, lest their judgment and condemnation be made the heavier. But this is not designed, dearly beloved brethren and sisters in the Lord, to deject the contrite hearts of the faithful, as if none might come to the supper of the Lord but those who are without sin. For we do not come to this supper to testify thereby that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves, but on the contrary, considering that we seek our life out of ourselves in Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that we lie in the midst of death. Therefore, notwithstanding, we feel many infirmities and miseries in ourselves, as namely that we have not perfect faith, and that we do not give ourselves to serve God with that zeal as we are bound that have daily to strive with the weakness of our faith and the evil lusts of our flesh. Yet since we are, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, sorry for these weaknesses and earnestly desirous to fight against our unbelief and to live according to all the commandments of God, therefore we rest assured that no sin or infirmity which still remaineth against our will in us can hinder us from being received of God in mercy and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly meat and drink. Let us now also consider to what end the Lord hath instituted his supper, namely that we do it in remembrance of him. Now after this manner are we to remember him by it. First, that we are confidently persuaded in our hearts that our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the promises made to our forefathers in the Old Testament, was sent of the Father into the world, that he assumed our flesh and blood, that he bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished everlastingly from the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life upon earth, and that he hath fulfilled for us all obedience to the divine law and righteousness, especially when the weight of our sins and the wrath of God pressed out of him the bloody sweat in the garden, where he was bound that we might be freed from our sins." that he afterwards suffered innumerable reproaches, that we might never be confounded, that he was innocently condemned to death, that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God, yea, that he suffered his blessed body to be nailed to the cross, that he might fix thereon the handwriting of our sins, and hath also taken upon himself the curse due to us, that he might fill us with his blessings, and hath humbled himself under the deepest reproach and pains of hell, both in body and soul, on the tree of the cross, when he cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken of him. And finally confirmed with his death and shedding of his blood the new and eternal testament, that covenant of grace and reconciliation, when he said, It is finished. Secondly, in that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ in his last supper took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In like manner also after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and said, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. That is, as often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you shall thereby, as by a sure remembrance and pledge, be admonished and assured of this, 
my hearty love and faithfulness toward you. That whereas you should otherwise have suffered eternal death, I have given my body to the death of the cross and shed my blood for you. And as certainly feed and nourish your hungry and thirsty souls with my crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life, as this bread is broken before your eyes, and this cup is given to you, and you eat and drink the same with your mouth in remembrance of me. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross as to the only ground and foundation of our salvation, wherein he has become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true meat and drink of life eternal. For by his death, he hath taken away the cause of our eternal death and misery, namely sin, and obtained for us the quickening spirit, that we by the same who dwelleth in Christ as in the head, and in us as his members, might have true communion with him, and be made partakers of all his blessings, of life eternal, righteousness, and glory. Besides that we by the same spirit may also be united as members of one body in true brotherly love, as the Holy Apostle saith, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. For as out of many grains one meal is ground and one bread baked, and out of many berries being pressed together one wine floweth and mixeth itself together, so shall we all who by a true faith are engrafted into Christ be altogether one body through brotherly love for Christ's sake, our beloved Savior, who has so exceedingly loved us and not only show this in word, but also in very deed toward one another. Here to assist us, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, amen. That we may obtain all of this, let us humble ourselves before God and with true faith implore his grace. Let us pray. O merciful God and Father, we beseech thee that thou wilt be pleased in this supper in which we celebrate the glorious remembrance of the bitter death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that we may daily more and more with true confidence give ourselves up unto thy Son, Jesus Christ, that our afflicted and contrite hearts through the power of the Holy Ghost may be fed and comforted with his true body and blood, yea, with him, true God and man, that only heavenly bread, and that we may no longer live in our sins, but he in us, and we in him, and thus truly be made partakers of the new and everlasting covenant of grace. That we may not doubt, but that thou wilt forever be our gracious Father, nevermore imputing our sins unto us, and providing us with all things necessary, as well for the body as the soul. As thy beloved children and heirs, grant us also thy grace, that we may take up our cross cheerfully, deny ourselves, Confess our Savior, and in all tribulations with uplifted heads expect our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, where he will make our mortal bodies like unto his most glorious body, and take us unto him in eternity. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Strengthen us also by this holy supper in the Catholic undoubted Christian faith, whereof we make confession with our mouths and hearts, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen that we may now be fed with the true heavenly bread, Christ Jesus. Let us not cleave with our hearts unto the external bread and wine, but lift them up on high in heaven, where Christ Jesus is our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father, whither all the articles of our faith lead us, not doubting, but we shall as certainly be fed and refreshed in our souls through the working of the Holy Ghost, 
with his body and blood as we receive the holy bread and wine in remembrance of him. We'll turn to Psalter number 203. We'll sing Psalter number 203, stanza 1. bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. As the bread is being distributed, I'll read from Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is, reject, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this do in remembrance of me.
As the wine is being distributed, I'll read from Psalm 118, beginning at verse 14. The Lord is my strength and song, and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God. I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Drink ye this do in remembrance of me. Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord hath now fed our souls at this table, let us therefore jointly praise his holy name with thanksgiving. And everyone say in his heart thus, Bless the Lord, O my soul, 
and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Who hath not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, and given us all things with him. Therefore God commendeth therewith his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more now, being justified in his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Therefore shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Amen. Let us turn to God in a prayer of thanksgiving. O almighty, merciful God and Father, we render thee most humble and hearty thanks that thou hast of thine infinite mercy given us thine only begotten Son for a mediator and a sacrifice for our sins and to be our meat and drink unto life eternal. And that thou givest us a lively faith whereby we are made partakers of such great benefits. Thou hast also been pleased that thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, should institute and ordain his holy supper for the confirmation of the same. Grant we beseech thee, O faithful God and Father, that through the operation of thy Holy Spirit, the commemoration of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ may tend to the daily strengthening of our faith and the saving fellowship with him through Jesus Christ, thy Son, in whose name we conclude our prayer. Amen. This time we turn our Psalters to Psalter number 203 once again, and we will sing the remaining stanzas, stanzas 2 through 5, as the thank offering is received for benevolence.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.